You're listening to the Kitchen Confession Podcast with Chef Mary Mamaliti. I have the opportunity to try recipes on people every day that I want to cook. There's a really a creative energy that happens there because I'm not pigeonholed into like one menu every day. I really am allowed to flow with my creativity and sort of make what I want. I grew up near um, Greek town in, in Toronto. Lots of sablaki, lots of moussaka. But I remember the first time I went to an Ethiopian restaurant. Just blown away by, you know, all the different flavors, but also there's so many similarities and the ingredients might be a little bit different, but food just always captured my imagination. My pantry is full of sauces and spices, things where I can take sort of everyday recipes and and create flavor delicacies. That's Andrea Bucket. She's a corporate chef and a media personality. Andrea loves to enjoy the different flavors that, that Toronto has to offer and then recreating them at home is her passion. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Mary. I'm so excited to have you here. It's always again, great to talk food. Right? Food is just so much fun. We're going to start. We're going to jump right in. And let's start with, how did you get started in the kitchen? Well, that's a good question. This road is not one that I ever expected to end up on. And I have to say, I never thought that cooking or being a chef for a living was in the cards for me. I just didn't see it as a, as a, as a career. And as a kid, I can remember, you know, like Friday nights, hopping in, into my parents' bed with my sister with like a big bowl of popcorn and like tuning into those original Food Network shows, right? Like Emeril Lagasse, The Two Fat Lady. Ah, yes. Yeah. And, but even before that, like The Urban Peasant and Walk With Yan, all those amazing cooking shows back in the day when they were still very instructional. And I just love every second of that. And so... As I moved through high school, um, I actually thought I was going to be a phys ed teacher. So I went to university to okay. be a phys ed teacher, which is like not even remotely close to what I do now. But what I did do is started working for a catering company. My aunt, uh, she was uh, she went to George Brown. She was a chef and uh, she needed some help with her catering company. And so I started helping her there. And what I found is that not only did I have this huge bank of knowledge, because I would just eat up food content. And back then, food content just meant books and TV Mm -hmm. Um, but I also was good at it, you know, and I was good at organizing and I was good at coming up with the recipe ideas and I was good at executing. And, you know, I still thought it was sort of like this part-time gig and then, you know, I had kids and then all of a sudden it parlayed into this career. I started Mm -hmm. teaching cooking classes. I started writing about food content, you know, food. Um, there was just so many things I wanted to try. Uh, and I did this all, I wasn't a trained chef. And did you start with a blog? No, I did not. I actually never had a blog. I started by, I reached out to, I think it was the LCBO and Loblaws at the time. They had these cooking schools that I thought, you know what, I'd like to be an assistant. I'd like to go and see what it's all about. I went and assisted one class and immediately I was like, I don't want to assist. I want to be the person teaching the class, Mm -hmm. which was so nervy of me. I think I was like 22. (laughs) You know, I had no formal food training, Uh, but that's just sort of how I've always lived my life. I was like, Hey, I can do this. And like looking back now, I would never do that today. Uh, But when you're younger, it's like, I think you have a, can I say balls? You have more balls. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Because it's so true. It's fitting. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I started teaching and I fell in love with it. As soon as I did that first class and it was all my classes had sold out, I just fell in love with standing up in front of a group of people, sharing my passion for food and, you know, teaching people how to, you know, bring these delicious flavors into their home. So I was hooked and that was it. And then I ended up, um, you know, working for Law Blah Cooking School as a cooking school manager. I did that for many years. But all along the way, I was like dabbling and doing local TV, like Roger's Daytime. And, you know, I was help supporting uh, some of the chefs at Law Blahs with food styling and stuff. So I was always doing things on the side, anything I can do to learn uh, and to build my career. And then I mm-hmm. ended up here where I am today. When did you know that you wanted to turn this passion of yours into a business? So I had been working at a health food store for for a while. And while I was working there, my kids were young. At the time, my kids were probably like three and five, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was still, you know, after I'd helped my aunt with her catering business, I sort of started my own catering business. And I'd pick up the odd gig here and there, anywhere from like 25 people up to 200 people. And I still thought of it as the side gig. Uh, and so I continued to do that. So it wasn't really until I got a full-time job at uh, Law Block Cooking Schools that I felt my career had officially moved into the realm of food. 
Um, and like I said, while I was there, I started, you know, doing writing food articles and developing recipes. And I had this sort of insatiable appetite as a teacher and someone who wants to share information, you're constantly mm-hmm. learning yourself. And that's also one of my MOs. Like I just love learning. So, you know, I worked at it. I learned about it as I went. Uh, I like to say I, I learned it so I could earn it. Right. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. A lot of people say fake it to make it. But yeah, I just really just dove in and I was working full time at the cooking schools and I was just, uh, you know, that was a great job at the time. And I got to meet a lot of great chefs. So it wasn't something that was always on your radar. Like, yeah, I want to do this as a business. First of all, it took me a long time to figure out that I was a creative person, which sounds ridiculous, but you mm-hmm. know, it took me a while to figure out, Oh, I'm a, this creative person who loves to like develop recipes. And, you know, I share my creativity through food, but then I had no business background. Like I am just, you know, and some creative people have that business acumen. Mm-hmm. I did not. I left the cooking schools about six years ago when uh, the chef at George Weston limited, he's the executive chef there. He's been there for 25 years. He came and he asked if I would like to come and work with them. And I thought it was an amazing opportunity because I was doing all this other stuff on the side, which I could Mm. see it was getting busier and I was starting to make money doing it because trust me, there were a lot of years where I didn't make money doing it because I also Mm -hmm. had a full-time job. And I agreed to go to George West Limited as a corporate chef, as a freelance chef. And then that's when I really started trying to figure out how to make money in this business via, you know, traditional broadcast and then of course social media. Mm -hmm. So it's really only been over the last five years. And then let me tell you, that's been such a learning curve for me um, that I've really honed Andrea Bucket Cooks as a business in in and of itself. Guess what time it is? It's game time. (laughs) Woohoo! I'm here for the game. Okay, we're gonna start with this or that. The choice is yours. You can get with this or you can get with that. Dine in or delivery? Dine in. Cupcake or pie? Cupcake. Parmesan or Asiago? Parmesan. Netflix or cable? Netflix. Are you a carnivore or veggies? Oh, oh God, that's a hard one. The older I get, veggies. (laughs) When you place your glasses into the cupboard, is it the upside down or right side up? Right side up. Salty or sweet? Salty. Dog or cat? Dog. I love it. You just went right through them. I know it's easy to go back and forth and be like, oh, kind of, but you know what? I kind of know, I know who I am. I want to talk about your business a little more because your business to me, I find it so interesting because there are many different facets to your business. So you do corporate and you do Andrea Bucket Cooks as freelance. Yeah. And that's for me, you know, I I struggled back and forth with giving up the corporate gig and, and going completely freelance. But I have an amazing um, position at George Weston Limited. I get to cook for the executives. Mm-hmm. I cook them lunch. You know, it's the window of time that I'm there is sort of like six hours. I the, the schedule is extremely flexible in terms of how we work it right now. Um, and I have the opportunity to try recipes on people every day that I want to that I want to cook. So it's very flexible. Um, there's a really um, a creative energy that happens there because I'm not you know, pigeonholed into like one menu every day, I really am allowed to, you know, flow with my creativity and sort of make what I want. Mm -hmm. Of course, keeping in mind, there's like dietary restrictions and all that sort of thing. But the other thing is I, I I feed the same, like, you know, five to 10 guys every single day. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge because you have to be creative every day, right? Because they, don't want to see the same food day after day or week after week. So Mm -hmm. I love it because it challenges me in that way. So because it's flexible and because it gives me uh, the ability to be creative, I stay there. Um, And then of course that flexibility allows me to grow my business. And I have a great team at uh, George Weston limited who supports what I do as well. So it's a good balance. So if we wanted to describe your cooking style, Mm -hmm. how would you describe it? Um, I would say Easy and straightforward recipes with dynamite flavor to help combat mealtime boredom. And I'll just take you back to the very first party that I ever catered. First of all, my girlfriend was going away to Australia. I was 18. She asked me if I'd catered her party because she knew I had this passion for food. And I said yes. And 
at the time, so this was like, so I'm 45 now. So this was, I, I don't, I don't do math, but I was 18 at the time. So many mm-hmm. years ago. <laughs> and I didn't have that much exposure to food, except for, you know, obviously living in this great diverse city of Toronto. But on that table was a collection, an eclectic collection of, I had spanakopitas, I had dulmades, I had um, Thai spring rolls, I had sushi, I had uh, like roasted red pepper dip. Like I just had this array of food, um, which at the time was a little bit eclectic. And you know how much money I made at that? I made a hundred bucks doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like for 40 people. <laughs> oh my God, it's so fun. So I'll say that like my approach is, is I always think about flavors. I try to use always what's local, obviously. I mean, first of all, it's the most economic and it's the most delicious way to, to cook. So, you know, using local seasonal ingredients and then infusing it with um, flavors um, from my travels or from, you know, different restaurants that I've gone to. So like, I love Thai food. I love Indian food. Um, I love Japanese food, uh, Mediterranean, like I, my pantry is full of sauces and spices mm-hmm. and um, things where I can take, you know, sort of everyday recipes and, and create flavor delicacies. To me, that, that table, that catering was screaming multiculturalism. Yeah. Like I grew up near um, Greek town in, in Toronto. So mm-hmm. lots of Sablaki, lots of Moussaka. And then, you know, Ethiopian food. I remember the first time I went to an Ethiopian restaurant and just, just blown away by, first of all, not the, you know, all the different flavors, but also there's so many similarities across cultural Absolutely. Food, right? And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I love pierogies, but then there's like these dim sum dumplings and there's like, you know, there's all these similarities and the ingredients might be a little bit different, but I don't know. I just, just food just always captured my imagination and connected me, connected me to like people and places around the world. What's one thing you wish you had known when you began your business? I will say, I, I really wish that I had been more confident from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, I always sort of felt like a bit, you know, maybe like 10 years ago, more like an imposter because I don't you had that have imposter my, syndrome, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't ha- like, you know, I don't have my um, red seal as a chef and I have worked with chefs in the past who have, you know, sort of not ha- like kind of like held that over me. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I let that get to me. So, you know, just like anything in life, you know, you kind of have to like drown out those voices that are either not supportive or, you know, for some reason, you know, have some insecurities themselves or trying to put them off on you. I don't know. I wish I had been more confident. And I think at this point, like, you know, I'm also in my mid forties, uh, as a female, as a mom whose kids are, you know, in their late teens and early Mm twenties, there's a certain kind of confidence that comes with that. And I don't think it's something you can teach. It's something you have to like grow into, but yeah, definitely having more confidence and not feeling like um, an imposter would have been great at the beginning. Yeah. And you know what? You're not alone with that. I had the same feeling. A lot of people do. Yeah. And I always even felt, you know, when people ask what I, even though like I ran a cooking school and I taught cooking classes and I work in a corporate kitchen, when people ask me what I do still to this day, like I shy away from the word chef because I, because I'm very, I don't know, the person that I work with at the very beginning of my career, he was very specific. You're not a chef. You don't have your red seal, but I'm like every day I'm working as a chef and I'm feeding people and I'm creating mm-hmm. these recipes. And, you know, it might not be in the traditional way that we think of chef, on, you know, on a restaurant on a line or expediting dishes. Yeah. Um, so it's taken me a long time to sort of take ownership of that term chef. I definitely don't feel like an imposter anymore. Like I definitely feel like I've, you know, I've earned my stripes as it were. I I feel like I belong here. I know what I have to offer. I'm confident in my abilities to like, you know, cook and create recipes. And that's the other thing. Like not all great chefs are great recipe developers. And also like sometimes if if you're called a chef, like some people feel like, oh, she's a chef, so I can't cook the recipe she puts Mm -hmm. out. So there's also that, you know, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter what we call ourselves. No, but I have you know, I'll say, yes, I'm a corporate chef. That's sort of the, the term I'll use now. So what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I say that because still to this day, you know, I mean, especially right now we're living in, you know, we've been six months in into the COVID, into the pandemic. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uncomfortableness that comes with not knowing what's ahead. And I think having your own business, especially if you don't have like, you know, it's not like I have a product or a food product that I'm selling or, 
you know, this is a business media specifically in recipe development that sometimes can be feast or famine. Sometimes budgets don't exist. Sometimes they do exist. Uh, things are constantly changing. You know, a good example for me is like all the TV that I had done automatically went to being filmed in my own house, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by myself, but, you know, having to help my kids help film and all that stuff. So being comfortable with the, un you know, being, un being uncomfortable um, or feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable is important because entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. And you have to realize that you don't always know. You don't always know what your destination is. You just keep mm -hmm. plugging away at what mm -hmm. you're doing. I'm Mary Mammolini, and you're listening to the Kitchen Confession Podcast. Today, I'm talking with Andrea Bucket, corporate chef and media personality. Okay, so on your website, you refer to the ABCs of cooking. What are they? So I was trying to figure out a way to sort of, um, I guess, separate myself from the pack because, you know, everyone puts out recipes and recipes are a dime a dozen. And I put out recipes and develop recipes for my website and videos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I thought, what am I not seeing um, in terms of information for people who maybe like already like to cook or just have some questions about techniques, ingredients, or equipment? And I thought, well, Andrea Bucket Cooks, you got A, you got B, you got C. So I was like, oh, the ABCs of cooking would be a great thing to do where I, you know, focused on either a technique, an ingredient, or um, a piece of equipment, and then just sort of, you know, gave people information or solutions to problems that they have in the kitchen or like, you know, queries they had that they might not think of asking. So I started this little um, series, I guess it is. and it ends up in two different plates. One, one, it's on the website and on the website, it's more of an article style. But then on my Instagram, I've been doing these carousels and I love them and they've been really popular. And it just takes maybe one or two pieces of information that people, you know, may not know about an ingredient and it teaches it to them. It's just like, you know, it's sort of like my way of like infusing sort of food science or information about not necessarily a recipe, but sort of how to cook. Right. or what to cook um, in a fun and approachable way. Oh, I love that. What are some of your favorite kitchen tips? Favorite kitchen tips? Uh, season your food. Holy jumping. Like season <laughs> your food. Just salt. Like let's get some salt in there, people. I understand that there are people that have like, you know, some sensitivities to salt or can't have mm -hmm. it for certain reasons. But yeah, learn to season your food properly. Taste it as you go. Like these are just all basic things that people should be doing. Um, if you have a recipe, here's a big pet peeve of mine because as a recipe, recipe developer, I often get questions or I get people, you know, emailing me about recipes that don't turn out. And I find that a people do not read the recipe all the way through. And okay. then they're constantly like substituting this and that, or, you know, I'm like, make the recipe one time as it is. If you're a person who follows recipes, look at the recipe, follow it, make it. Then if it doesn't turn out and you've used all the ingredients and all the cooking times that I've suggested and you have something to say, email me. My sister's a great example here. She, I had these, this basic recipe. They were like from uh, Tex-Mex um, meatloaf, like in like, you know, muffin tins. Mm -hmm. And she emails me and she says, I made your recipe. It was great. Um, she goes, but I didn't have black beans. So I left the black beans out. And then she's like, and I didn't have breadcrumbs. So I, I left the breadcrumbs out <laughs> and like, there was about three or four things. And then, and then, then at the end of it, she says, and the oil, like they were a little bit oily. The oil came up over the top. And I was like, okay, well, if you had add the, added the breadcrumbs, that would have <laughs> totally fixed that. Like, and she's like, I'm like, so you made my recipe, but you actually didn't make my recipe. Did you? Because you changed like four things in the recipe. She's like, yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, you know, emailing me to tell me that it hadn't worked. Oh, so I like that tip. Follow the full recipe. Yeah, follow the full recipe. Make sure you have all the ingredients and go from there and season. Yeah, those are my two tips. What's your favorite go-to meal? I'm a soup girl. I could eat, so I, like there's not one specific recipe, but I would say soup is what I love to eat most often. Um, and when I'm at the office, I, I cook it almost every day. So I love, you know, pureed soups. I love a potato. I do this great potato and dill with buttermilk soup. That's delicious. Okay. Share that one. Cause that sounds delicious. Oh, and it's so easy. Like soups are so easy. And this is a, I mean, you can puree it or not, but, 
Um, what I do is I literally take like a, an onion and a leek, probably. It doesn't even have mm-hmm. to be a leek. Like if you want to go really basic, you can go uh, an onion, uh, celery, and, right? And you saute that down, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Maybe put a couple, uh, I always have thyme in my fridge, a couple sprigs of thyme in there. Mm-hmm. Just throw the whole thing in there. Uh, cut up a couple Yukon gold potatoes, throw them in. But the key is to make sure that you sweat out your onions and your leeks enough where enough water has evaporated from them and the flavor has concentrated. I find that people at home really skip that step. So, and that's where you get a lot of the flavor. I agree. You really got to sweat that out. Yeah. Give it some time. So um, add your potatoes, then add chicken stock. If you're a veggie, then you can add veggie stock. Just enough to cover the potatoes. Uh, bring it to a simmer. And then um, once they're fork tender, pull out the thyme because you obviously don't want to puree the thyme stems. Mm-hmm. Pull out the thyme and then um, a little touch of nutmeg, just like a little bit. Mm-hmm. Puree it and then top it with buttermilk and fresh oh dill. Gosh. It is flipping amazing. It is so good. You know, I want to make that today now. Yeah. Even though it's like 30 something outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just love soup. And buttermilk is one of those ingredients. I mean, I grew up, my dad used to drink it right out of the out of the carton. And I used to hate the smell of it because it's so sour smelling when you're a kid. Yeah. But as an adult, I mean, there's that whole, you know, the things that really elevate the flavors of dishes like salt and, and acid and, and like heat, things like that. And, you know, buttermilk has an acidity to it that really levels up the flavor of something like a a potato that can be sort of uh, starchy and dense. So Mm. the acidity of that buttermilk really plays well with, um, and it's a great thing to do if you don't want to add cream to your mashed potatoes, like add a load of buttermilk. It's the same thing as like adding like maybe like a full fat yogurt or something. Um, It's just delicious and it adds a whole level of, of, of flavor. Oh my God, that sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about your critics. Who are your toughest <laughs> critics? <laughs> We're both laughing because I know who this is. <laughs> so I have two boys. I have uh, Cameron, he's 21, and Stowe is uh, 18. And, you know, they've grown up in a house where I'm always testing recipes and I'm always, you know, they love food. They are, I would definitely say that they their palates are way better than my palate ever was um, at their ages because I've exposed them to, you know, great restaurants and, and great cooking. But every time I make a meal now, you know, of course, when I'm developing recipes, I like feedback, but now without doubt, every time we sit down to dinner, you know, they give me their unsolicited opinions and they have opinions. I'm telling you. Um, and it can be frustrating. So okay. What do they say to you? What do they say to you? Um, I remember one time I made this dish and it was, I don't make many dishes that are complete fails, especially at home when I'm just cooking away. But I had been seeing this, like, um, like these baked gnocchi recipes. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I, I had some gnocchi and I had spinach and I had cheese and sauce. And I was like, oh, that. anyways, I, I made it. I put it in the oven. I came out and wow, it was bad. It was like, <laughs> they were like, this is like worse than cat food. No way. Like, oh my God. Like, anyways, it was, anyways, it was horrible. So, but you know, they'll say that about just about anything, you know, and, and my, my kids have very specific, uh, what they like and what they don't like. And, uh, they don't, they don't hold back. Oh, that's too funny. Cat food. <laughs> It's like, you know, it comes a point where I'm like, okay, we're going to sit down to dinner. I don't, I don't want your feedback. Like, I don't, you know, I don't care if you like it or not. Just eat it, you know. <laughs> Some days, like, I'm in the kitchen all day and then, you know, I might be testing recipes and maybe, like, right now I'm in the middle of developing a bunch of blueberry recipes. So mm-hmm. a lot of it is dessert recipes. And so then I'll go to cook dinner. And I won't really care. I'll just, like, throw something together and that's just the way it is, right? I'm like, there's toast and avocado if you want it or toast and beans. Like, <laughs> yeah. go for it. Okay, let's do rapid fire. Let's see if I can stump you here. What is your junk food kryptonite? Beef jerky. Oh, good one. If your fridge could talk, what would be the one word it would use to describe your snack choices? Savory. You've got five minutes to move into a new kitchen and you can only take one item with you. What would it be and why? Equipment or or ingredient? Anything. (sighs) Chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) Describe your culinary style in two words. Flavorful, family. Favorite curse words to use in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> like, for F's sakes. For f's sake. <laughs> <laughs> huh? 
Justin Timberlake brought sexy back, what would you bring back? Fun. Nice. I said my 21-year-old body. Oh, I'm past that. (laughs) I ask every guest to share a kitchen confession with us. Do you have one? Yeah, so this is the one that I refer to most often when I'm cooking because I I want people to be fearless in the kitchen, but being fearless in the kitchen really means that you have to make mistakes to just like life, right? It's cooking Mm -hmm. like a metaphor for life. So when I was in university and when I really started, because I was living away from home and you really have to start cooking for yourself, um, I wanted to make, you know, a, a curried couscous soup. And I took out to university my dad's giant stock pot. It was huge. It was massive. Mm-hmm. And so I start making the soup. You know, it's traditional, like onions, carrots, uh, whatever, uh, celery, and you know, sweating it down. And you add the broth, you know, the curry and all this stuff. And you add the broth. And then you add, like, like now as a, someone who cooks a lot, I'd say you probably had to add, like, maybe half a cup of couscous or something to it. Mm-hmm. So anyways, I had the pot like this is a big pot. I can't even say how big it goes. And I added the um, broth and then I added the couscous and like, I couldn't see anything. So then and I went to the bulk one and bought a big bag. And then I added more couscous and nothing. And I was like, oh, God, like this is like hardly any couscous. Like, so I just added almost, I don't know. I probably added like <laughs> three or four cups of couscous, maybe more. And I put the lid on and I left to go to school, probably to go to uh, a lecture and I left it on the stove, like turned off. And when I came home, the whole pot was jam packed with couscous. It was not a soup. It was like a block of couscous. And yeah. So that's probably, I mean, that was at the very beginning, but I, I remember that. And uh, it, it was funny. It was funny. But you know what's funny? People make that mistake all the time. I have a recipe. It's easy to do. Yeah. Even with pasta or like orzo, like if you're making a soup, what I find is like, you know, often for a soup, like that's maybe served six or eight, I'll say usually a half a cup or maybe a cup of pasta mm-hmm. and then it'll get cooked. And then people will be like, I didn't think it was quite enough pasta. And they'll add like a whole other cup. And by the time you do that and it cooks, well, you've got like pasta, you don't have like soup anymore. Right. <laughs> exactly. And then it just continues to soak up the liquid and get big. And anyway, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. That's all I got. You were fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. If anyone wants to reach out, where can listeners connect with you online? You can check me out. Uh, I'm on all the social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram at Andrea Bucket Cooks and uh, on my website at andreabucket.com. Excellent. If you want more tips, you can check her out on her website. Thanks so much, Mary. This was so much fun. This is a great way to spend a little time with a uh, fellow foodie. It's that time. We've reached the end of another show. Be sure to visit kitchenconfession.com for more recipes and foodie finds. I'd like to thank producer and editor Matt Agnew, and I'm Mary Mammoliti. See you at the next episode.